Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Activity Strong Executive Edition webinar. My name is Megan McMahon, and I am the Director of Strategic Development here at Link Senior. For today's webinar, we are providing you with one free NAB, NCAP, NCCDP, NCTRC, and NZSRDT CEU credit. To be eligible for those CEU credits, you do need to remain on this webinar for the full hour today. At the end of the webinar, I'm going to provide the required post-webinar CEU survey evaluation link in the chat box, and we'll also send it to you by email this afternoon. So please be sure to check your spam folder in case it lands there. This CEU survey must be completed by midnight Eastern time this Thursday. If you do have any questions, please email us at webinars at linksenior.com. And CEU certificates will be issued by email before the end of the day on Friday, March 13th. I'll now go ahead and hand it over to Charles de Vilmorn, CEO and co-founder of Link Senior. Charles? <clears throat> Thank you, Megan. Thank you very much for the, uh, for the introduction. Welcome. Welcome, everyone. This is uh, uh, May 10th, our Activity Strong Executive Edition. So as a reminder, that special edition of our Activity Strong effort is all about elevating um, activities on life enrichment and resident engagement and all of the people that are in charge of helping our elders, our residents find purpose every day. So as a quick pause, I, I want to thank you all professionals for doing the amazing work that you are doing. And also thank you for any one of you that is not in a particular department or discipline for joining us, because that means that you understand the value of an activity in life enrichment professionals work, and you also have respect for it, have an understanding and want to learn, which is what we're hoping we'll achieve today with our amazing uh, speaker, Ryan Frederick, who is actually the CEO of uh, a Smart Living 360, which I'll introduce in just a few seconds, but before I do that, I do want to share that this particular edition of Activity Strong is done in partnership with Bridge the Gap podcast. And Activity Strong as a whole is a uh, initiative led by Link Senior, but very importantly, in partnership with amazing organizations that include NAP, NCAP, and Activity Connection. So that's kind of for the quick slide here. Before I get started, also, I do want to remind you all that as we're very busy in the chat, let's not forget to select from the drop down everyone because sometimes we have people talking to, to just the panelists, which is great. Please talk to us. We'd love that. But also, if you want your comments to be shared with everyone, make sure that you select everyone. So as Megan mentioned, my name is Charles de Vilmoren. I uh, am excited to be with you, especially excited to be with you, Ryan. Very excited for our conversations today. But like Megan said, I am the uh, CEO and co-founder of an organization called Link Senior. We're based in Washington, D.C., and uh, this is my quick bio, but essentially, I really believe that quote-unquote old people are cool, and uh, we have a few announcements about that at the end of the, today's session, and obviously, I believe that our industry, the senior living industry, is quote-unquote activities strong. You know, this organization that I, I co-founded 15 years ago in Washington, D.C., we have these amazing initiatives, ways to give back, but also show things that matter to us. So as I mentioned, old people are cool. This was essentially designed with the idea that we don't big, we're not big fan of segregation based on age, like everyone is cool, right? That's the main message. And, um, and an activity strong, that was a result of our team coming together at the beginning of the pandemic, wondering what can we do for the industry, right? Because we love the industry, uh, as, as, as a lot of you, if, if not all of you remind, remember how much of a crisis mode we were then two years ago. And this was our way to give back and support. You know, it's an industry we're fully focused on this industry. As I mentioned, we have uh, Link Senior is a resident engagement platform. And so we're very lucky today. We've reached um, and we continue to grow, but we, we touched the life of 47,000 elders in the US and Canada. And we work with amazing organizations, some of which are shown here. The most common point amongst all of them is that they care for their residents and employees. 
right? They are, as you can see, from all sorts of shape, size, and form. But the one common denominator is they believe in elevating resident engagement. And the way we help them is, again, we are an engagement, a resident engagement company. So we have a combination of technology, education, human touch. And, um, and if you're in, interested in any of that, please be in touch. We're very proud of our work. It is uh, evidence-based, as shown with this slide. It was published in a peer, some of the research that we did was published in a peer-reviewed journal in 2019. So that's a little bit about us. Now, on to our webinar. I'm so excited because I, I met Ryan years ago uh, when he lived in Washington, D.C. And uh, Ryan, I like to call you uh, kind of a friend. Like we've, we've met and interacted on so many different occasions. But I think the best way to introduce uh, Ryan is this fact that we just share so much common, I don't know, passions, uh, thought and values. And because May 4th was last week, I thought that just bringing a slide about May the age be with you was, was kind of a <laughs> nice way to get introduced here. But um, everyone, I'm excited to introduce you to Ryan Frederick. He's a CEO of an organization called um, Smart Living 360. For, you know, for the background, when uh, in Washington, D.C., when we started this chapter from Aging 2.0, we had this amazing group. We were very fortunate to have this amazing group of uh, what we at the time called wise people, people that knew a lot, were generous with their time, passionate about advancing the field of aging, and also passionate about change being respectfully but disruptive and loving new ideas, entertaining new ideas, and seeing what's stick, and then helping spread these ideas. So today, uh, excited to be with you, Ryan. Uh, just as a quick note, we'll be referencing some, but not all the time, about an amazing book. So um, we'll, we'll point to that. I personally, it was one of my best reads this year. So I know we're not through the year, but top three this year. Uh, so that's a long intro. Ryan, take it from there. Thank you. Thanks, Charles, and thanks, Megan. Um, it, it's it's fun, Charles, because you're right. I'm thinking back to it. We intersected around the time you started Link Senior, and and uh, it's fond memories because you're that wise people group you talk about. It's um, we were fortunate. We had a cluster of people passionate about ways to make an impact on the lives of older adults and in a variety of different ways. And uh, we're yeah, blessed that we cross paths and it's, it's awesome to see the, uh, the development of, of, of Link Senior and the impact that, that, that you personally have and the organization and Megan and others on, on a daily basis on something that I believe is among the most important things here for senior housing organizations and communities, which is really uh, helping uh, residents and, and elders uh, embrace uh, all that's possible in these additional chapters in life, you know, making it making every day count. So uh, it's exciting to re be reminded of the history, and then uh, and then and then catch up uh, now uh, now real time here in May of 2022. So excited to be here, as as Charles mentioned, um, I've been in the field around the same time as Charles. Um, and I've worn a, a number of different hats prior to Smart Living 360. So I've, uh, it, I think it's helpful. I've been um, uh, on the investment side. I've been on the operations side. I actually lived in a community uh, in Atlanta for a summer uh, as, as part of a summer internship. I've got some good stories there. Uh, I've developed new communities, some intergenerational, actually one outside of DC. I've been the board member of uh, some organizations, uh, not-for-profit and otherwise in our field. And a lot of the work I do today uh, with Smart Living 360 is on the strategy consulting side to a variety of different clients, ranging from health systems like Hopkins and investment firms and quite a number of, of providers, multifamily and then senior living, of course, here. Uh, and uh, But the new, the latest, I guess, misadventure uh, has been with the book, which uh, Charles alluded to, which has been um, really a thrill, uh, I would say, because uh, I started down this path because uh, with Right Place, Right Time, because I have a um, brother-in-law who's a really successful author and he's a psychologist. And he was getting a lot of questions related to aging. And he said, Ryan, people don't know what to do. Go help them. And I, and I studied engineering in, in college in large part to uh, avoid reading and writing. So there's a lot of irony in this. 
Um, but he broke me down. Um, and one thing led to another, got a book agent and, and, and Johns Hopkins press is the a publisher came out, um, uh, mid October last year. And, and it's really, it's been a thrill, uh, in part because just like Charles said, I mean, there's so many of us in our, in our field here that we're just oriented towards impact. And it's been really fulfilling to me to see people, uh, really raise on people's radar screens, um, like why place matters in the context of a long life. And we're going to, we're going to get into that in more detail here in our conversation, but I, but I do want to say that this book, it's not, it's not a senior living book. It's not a book for industry professionals, although quite a number of industry professionals have found it valuable. A number of people in the industry have found it valuable um, for a number of reasons we'll get into later. Um, but one of the key things here is just, we have an amazing story to tell. And it's really important that we tell that story as, as best we can. Um, and, and I think this book, as, as, and I actually was on a workshop earlier today with some uh, consumers uh, in, in Rochester, New York, doing a workshop for them. And it's interesting just to see how people are processing. They don't necessarily understand the role of place as well as they could. In some cases, they don't necessarily understand how the right senior housing place can be helpful if that's where they are too. So a key thing in it, which we'll get into later on too, is I um, got some 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 feedback. There's a self-assessment in the book, just helping people understand why place, uh, where their play, their current place may fit relative to purpose and social connection, physical being, financial being, and so on. And that assessment, um, based on the feedback, I create an online version of that. So that might be something that would be valuable to some of you, as well as I've actually had a number of sales and marketing teams that have reached out looking to use that to help people in their in their journey of finding the right place. So, um, uh, so yeah. So we'll we'll be we'll talk more about that here shortly with Charles and and then in terms of word of context, uh, just next slide. Um, similar to Charles, I, I guess I should have taken a moment to see where there's overlap. But uh, with the strategy consulting practice of of Smart Living three hundred and sixty, work with a lot of groups, um, and it it's for groups that are really interested in digging deep into the right set of questions, I believe, to position their organizations to succeed over the long term. And typically the work is it's almost similar to McKinsey in consulting where it's working with CEOs, boards, uh, investment firms, uh, uh, typically over a six month time frame to help people really unpack where are they, uh, where would they like to go and then how to get there. And invariably, this subject of making an impact, the subject of truly understanding how to orient your programming and culture to have the most profound impact on, on residents and their families um, is a core piece of where we spend time on. Um, but as, as you can see here, work with a wide range of groups from small to big, from not-for-profit to for-profit, it's a wide group. Uh, but eager, eager uh, to have our conversation, Charles. Thanks, Ryan. So where do we start, right? We have this audience that I'm sure would enjoy most of your book, if not all of your book, absolutely. But I thought that one place we could start is with one key element, which obviously drives us all, but you make a reference several times in this book, which is purpose. Right, as, as you know, a lot of our audience, all of our audience has either a good understanding or a very good understanding of what it is to collaborate with the elders so they find purpose. In your book, you talk about purpose as something as a goal for the place, to understand the place. Can you unpack a little bit how, uh, as you were writing this book and after, um, th that idea of purpose from there and go into your book. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, Charles, um, one of the fun things about writing a book, uh, and I should say before I do that, I, I thought um, writing the book uh, based on, I, well, I got just, I'm sure just like you, Charles, you know, questions from friends. What do I do? How do I do this? And so I thought I would uh, uh, save myself time. By, by writing a book. Now that, that probably was a bit foolish, you know, in retrospect, because the book, uh, book takes a lot, took as much time to edit it as to write it. Um, but also it's led to a lot of uh, conversations, which I've really been enjoying, which is 
spending more time with, with, with people, understanding their journeys. I've also had an opportunity to think about where are we as a country, and I'm going to tackle purpose on a few different fronts. Um, yeah. So when we look at purpose, uh, you know, it's actually it's a challenge right now across our society. It's a it's a real issue for young people today. How do they find uh, purpose? And when I when I when I define purpose, I see it as you know something uh, that motivates you each and every day that is larger than yourself. And purpose defined in that way is one of the strongest element that correlates to overall happiness and well-being. And so while, so I think it's important to start off by saying purpose is really foundational for our lives at any age. You know, the challenge that we, that we face individually, and then of course, and for many of us in our professional lives, is how can we help translate that, that purpose into, into later stages of life? Um, you know, I, 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 I know you're similar, uh, you know, on this, Charles, like we were in a period of, of transition in our field because a lot of what's been created was really based on the greatest generation. And we need to modify our brands, our delivery systems, uh, our cultures that work in today's world and appeal to, you know, baby boomers and then increasingly, you know, Gen X and others uh, over time. And and so that one of the terms I just want to raise for a moment, which is the term retire. You know, I remember I, I used to be, uh, we used to watch a lot of baseball growing up, um, not as much now, but I saw, I tuned in the, during the playoffs. And so back in the fall, when the playoffs were happening, there was a, a batter that hit a ball to left field and, and, and the outfielder caught the ball. And the play-by-play -play announcer said, the batter has now been retired, like wiped off the field, no longer exists. And, and so we have this term that often is embedded yeah. in some of our communities, that certainly is embedded in our broader culture uh, that is effectively means to withdraw and disappear. And that is the exact opposite of what the research is around having uh, you know, really successful aging. It's about having this deliberate purpose. Now, in a lot of the work that I've done with people related to this book, I found that a number of people don't have, uh, they don't have a compass of how to figure out the best way to uh, identify purpose in this retirement stage, you know, some people uh, find it in uh, in grandkids. Sometimes uh, the grandkids aren't necessarily quite as excited to have their purpose be found in their grandparents. Not always. Um, so, but but there are things they go through. I, I found that um, you know one of the roles I think it's important for senior living communities is uh, is to help unpack people's stories. So you know you had a story before you moved into senior living. Like, how can we think of it as what's that next chapter? And, and by understanding those stories and, and then providing instigation of what those next chapters can look like, and also recognizing that it's not a solo journey, there's ways that we can find purpose in collaborating together. Um, I think there's a key role that senior living communities have to come alongside um, uh, residents, uh, along with families in some instances, to, to, to provoke people in a positive way around what, um, what purpose can look like, recognizing it's customized to the individual. And last comment on, comment on this, you know, activities is a part of that, but it's broader than that. And as people find their elements of, of purpose and we can encourage and create cultures where that's possible, then that often channels the activities and, and, and uses of time and energy that, that aligned with that purpose. So it's foundational, it's foundational any age, but it's particularly hard uh, as we get older. And I've, I've run into quite a number of people as I've, I've, as I've been speaking around this book where that, that, that's a key challenge they have. Yeah, thanks. Um... My mind is going obviously in all sorts of direction, given what you just said, which is which is cool. Um, you know, like I, I like what you said about the word retirement. I remember, you know, when we initially came out with "old people are cool," and we still have today a fair amount of people say you shouldn't use the word "old" uh, because of reason X, Y, Z. And often we believe, well, we think that the problem is that 
we as a society have, have let the world old build some kind of deficiency into it. And so we're all about reclaiming that world old. I mean, world, I mean that it is a beautiful world, world, right? And so I agree with what you said about this idea of retiring, you know, what would we replace it or like, but what, what's the problem with that particular word and how do we quote unquote brand it? You know, and the other thing that you said here, which is it starts with the life story. I, I love to hear this because as an activity professional, uh, you know, it starts by with the residents, right? Like the first thing that an activity professional is going to do with a uh, resident is to get to know them. And there are different methods. At the very basic aspect is some kind of assessment, like a life story, uh, gathering preferences and so on. And I also like, because you repeated it twice, this idea of collaborating, right? We, I think the old way of doing activities is I'm going to do four, right? The new way and something that you advocate also in your book is this idea of collaborating. How can we as an industry collaborate with the individual? So I definitely love that. But let's get into something kind of one step below, which is more actionable and granular, which is something that we've referenced several times already, which is this, this, this idea of assessment. So let me just choose sex, Brian, if you don't mind. I want to explain to everyone that obviously the book that Ryan wrote, I believe in it oh, wholeheartedly. I've actually, um, Ryan, I'm sure you've seen on your Amazon account probably if you sell, because in the past few days, I, I've been walking around and recommending this book. But regardless, whether you consider the book or not, I would at least recommend all of you to recommend to, to check out what we reference as the assessment. So, so, so let, thanks, for, thanks for your patience here, Ryan. Um, would you mind helping us understand the background of that assessment, which I think is really one of the fundamental pieces in, in your book, and also tell us from, um, and Beth Dell just said she just purchased this. Yeah, one more. <laughs> yeah, Sorry thanks, for doing Beth. that. But um, uh, t t take, it, take it from the angle of, again, people in the audience, mostly from this new living industry, uh, you know, you referenced the fact that the book was not written for them directly, but ultimately is super interesting and helpful for them. And if you don't mind, start with the assessment. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, I, I think I should take you on the road with me more often, Charles. Um, I think that, uh, so, so part of it, you know, big picture, very rough math, we have about 10% of people 75 and older are in some form of private pay senior housing, very rough math. So the vast majority are not in senior housing today for a variety of different reasons. And so we have to recognize that uh, when we're focusing on how to thrive as we age, um, most people aren't in senior housing. And so the question is, then they may be there over time, a number of them, but the question, one of the key questions is they're making decisions about place by virtue of where they're living or choosing you know, not to move from. And, and so one of the key things that I spend time on the book is to help people appreciate like basically why place matters. And, and it's, um, you know, I had a number of ideas uh, in terms of wanting to write the book, but then you, I learned in the research that my ideas became more nuanced and deeper as I learned more. Like I thought I knew a subject and then you spend 40,000 words like, oh gosh, now I know this a lot, a lot better. And, and one of the areas, again, it's actually not necessarily linked just to age, but place just makes, it makes a huge difference. And, and so um, oftentimes, and to, 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 I want to unpack a couple of things related to that, that, that feeds into the assessment. First one is when, when I say place, I don't mean just uh, like the four walls. While often that's what we think about, that's our physical place. But it's also what neighborhood are we in? What like metropolitan area are we part of? Are we in a rural, suburban, urban area? Uh, or what region of the country, even what country we're in? And our lived experience is a composite of those different elements of place. And so, for example, if you might have a beautiful home uh, house, but in a, in a dangerous or struggling area, your place necess isn't necessarily great. At the same time, you may be in a great metropolitan area that's, that has a lot of opportunity, but your physical place may not be appropriate. So, so it's not aligned. So we have to look at these different channels. And then we also have to recognize going back to the purpose and social connection, the physical well-being, the financial well-being, that place 
has a very important influence in these other areas. So um, uh, the Gallup Healthway, Health, Health, Healthways, they created a well-being index several years ago where they broke well-being into five areas. So it was purpose, social connection, physical well-being, financial well-being, and then place. And so what's, what's happened is that uh, when we think about place only as our physical dwelling, we miss a lot about its impact in our, in our life. Uh, and so we have to recognize, I encourage people then to think about, as I look at the life stage of my am, do I have the purpose that I should have or I'd like to have? Am I as socially connected as I'd like to be? Now, we know our society was struggling with, with elements of loneliness before the pandemic. And so it's a bigger issue now. You know, am I physically active as I like to be? And then not insignificantly, am I financially set up to, to really live over a longer life? Because it's not just our lifespan, it's also a correspondingly long health span and, and wealth span. And so what I've done with the, the, this assessment tool is created a series of questions uh, initially in the book, but then you know, a month or so ago added a, an online version just based on how it seemed to be so helpful for people is to help probe a little bit to say, hey, are you where, how are you doing, do you think, on purpose? And how do you think you're doing in social connection and so on? And allows people through these set of, uh, of questions to get a dashboard view on kind of where am I on this? Um, it's had an interesting uh, there have been some interesting stories that have come out of this actually in senior living where some sales and marketing people have used the book, actually also this as assessment tool to help people think about where are they are in their journey um, uh, to say, are, is this perhaps, um, is it a time to think about something different? And, and, and then one last piece of this, Charles, I think one of the the, the questions that a lot of communities have to, to, to ba have to balance is we're, we're all, all of us have, um, you know, challenges with, well, not everyone, but a number of people, a number of organizations like occupancy is top of mind for a lot of folks. Um, so in some sense, if we have anyone interested in coming in, like that's a good thing, but there's another side of that, which is there are some people that are really well suited to thrive in our communities. And if there's a way that we can attract more of those people, they come and they understand how the gaps in their life our communities can help solve, then they're all the more likely to jump in, in the engagement, in the activities, see the benefit. And last piece on this, if they're making that decision on their own, like they're owning that, they're less being pushed by, by family or friends, I believe yeah. those are the types of people also that do get more engaged more immediately, you know, into the community. So it, if we can help people understand where they are in their journey and then effectively self-select into mm -hmm. the communities that we have, I think that's a, could be a really good outcome. So it becomes ideally more than 10% of people yeah. out there say, Hey, this is the right thing for me. Yeah. But you know, Ryan, I, I, actually, I would love us to go one step further in that direction you know, we know that many activity professionals are great at working with other departments, including the marketing and sales department. And, you know, like sales, ultimately, it's, it's all about what can you do to accelerate the sales at a lower cost type of thing, right? So actually, if you don't mind, let's talk about this, like some of the tools that you talk about, you know, when we were preparing for this, you mentioned the word accelerating sales. Right. So it's not like forcing people through a process that never works. Right. But it's quite the opposite, which is it's a balance between education being slightly prescriptive, but also kind of listening to the individuals. Walk us that through walk, like, walk us through that path, if you don't mind. Yeah. So, um, you know, as a you know, previously a senior executive at one of the largest senior housing companies, so I've seen this through the lens of an operator. And if you go through your sales and marketing budget, both a marketing budget to be known, but I would say even more so the sales time that's taken yep. with coordinating visits, with spending time when they're there. And a lot of that's important, okay? A lot of that's important because um, you wanna understand their story and they need to understand yours. 
The challenge is if, if those visits are not a couple, but they're five, seven, 10, there's a huge opportunity cost associated with your salespeople's time. And so if there's a yep. way in which people can accelerate their learning, accelerate their understanding of fit, is this the right thing for me on their own so that they're able to better say, this is either right or not. It's, it ends up being, I think, better for, for everyone. So that's what I've seen a bit with some of these tools, Charles, is that um, I've seen some situations where people have taken um, the assessment, for example, or have dove in a bit more into the book. I'm in the process of taking more content from the book and digitizing it. But there's ways there where if they can see something that's like an objective third party, they get to see the pros and cons of what's out there uh, and accelerates the, the sales uh, cycle. It, it minimizes the opportunity cost of people's sales yep. and marketing budget, but also there's real value in, in having higher occupancy faster. Uh, so there's a lot to kind yep. of consider that. I, I think there's a challenge. I mean, since you and I have met, first met 15 years ago, like there's a ongoing education that our field um, has relative to consumers, you know, still a lot of people yep. when they hear when they when they hear senior living, they're thinking skilled nursing, uh, and that's still yep. you know very much true today. Uh, so I think there's a real value as this plays out uh, around helping people understand what's out there. And last piece on this, um, just to be super clear, you know, the book is a consumer book, and it's not a senior housing book. The senior housing is, a, is just one chapter in it. In fact, frankly, it was the hardest chapter for me to write because maybe I knew too much. <laughs> but, but what it allows people to do is to go in in an in a optimistic, uh, non-judgmental way, kind of choose, hey, hey, this thing really yep. matters. Make sure you make a good choice. And it, and it probes people to be, I think, more thoughtful in their decision making. Yeah. But, you, you know, I, I think it's also, it's, I think it's always great for one to be reminded that one is an option, right? Like senior living sometimes doesn't, <laughs> no, but seriously, like it, yeah. it, it helps for introspection, kind of self-learning and also, you know, constructive feedback. I, I'd love if you don't mind, like, let, let's take one step even deeper in w all of what this means for uh, activity and life enrichment. And I think, I have at least two ideas that we could do this. In your book, for example, you remind us that one can go and visit a community and the good visits are when the uh, uh, professional that is, that is touring tells us, yeah, you, we have other people like this. And for example, in the chat right now, a few minutes ago, somebody by the name of Stacy Morazzo was saying, my peeps love to learn and are all about culture and sample cuisine, teaching about cultures and so on. Like that is very valuable, right? If every prospect of Stacy's community would know about that, that would accelerate sales, wouldn't it? So give us that example because you do you do, do a good job in the book also ref referencing to that. Yeah, so a couple things on that. Um, you know, I think, I know a number of you are uh, here on the, uh, on our session have backgrounds in activities or levels of resident engagement. And, and so two things I wanna point out. Um, one piece is we need to be really mindful. And I'm, I suspect some of you um, have run into this from time to time. What our sales teams say and, and that lived experience, they're not always the same. And, and it's really important, I believe, for, for sales and marketing teams to understand how, like, like how engagement and, and activities and so on truly happen to the betterment of residents so they can convey that. And it's important so the conversation isn't too much solely about, I'm being somewhat facetious here, but about the, the, the features in the, in the unit, for example. On the, on the other hand, it's also important that the, the, the engagement and activity uh, folks, that they understand um, how things are being conveyed by the sales and marketing team. So they're delivering on the promise. Because, you know, fundamental I in this, I believe is that place is this driver. Like if people care enough about 
watching what they eat or, or exercising, the decisions about place should be mm -hmm. on that same pedestal. It's a really significant decision. And so we should make sure in this process that like how we say we're doing it actually is how it's being done and it's making a measurable yeah. impact. And then the, the, la the second twist on this is, I know you previously have had Jill Vitale Awesome on as a guest and she's awesome. I mean, <laughs> I guess literally and figuratively. <laughs> um, and, and she, we're part of a think tank uh, together. And I really, I just so treasure, you know, her book on, on the mind shift that needs to happen. Yep. And, and fundamental, and her, her, her point is this idea that, um, is that we need to empower people as more citizens. And, mm -hmm. and so I think mm -hmm. as, as, we, as we shift more to the baby boomers and we think about it, it's just like you said earlier, Charles, like how can we, as, as part of the ethos of these organizations, how can we truly partner with our residents? Um, there's one organization I'm working with now where we're, we're actually rebuilding how they do resident engagement. We're, we're, we're redoing it, uh, focused on um, this, this level of citizenship and empowerment, and then making sure that the brand and the sales and marketing teams are aligned that way. So this is, when I think about the promise of what place offers, particularly for senior housing, it's, it is here in the, in, in, the, in the engagement teams, the activities teams, like that is the secret sauce. And so it's so important yeah. that, 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 that people understand that and, and are using um, you know, the, the, the best possibilities to help people uh, you know, live that best next chapter. And I, and I do want to say one more thing, Charles, because we skipped over this a little bit earlier. And that is uh, to go back to the eight, you know, um, old is cool piece. Um, I, we're all subject to ageism. We're all subject to ageism. And so this, this belief that tomorrow is going to be, uh, tomorrow promises to be a lesser version of me than today. Yeah. We're all impacted by yeah. that. And, but, but, and so part of our role is, is understanding that that's not all consistent with the research. There's something called the U-shaped happiness curve. I go into that in the book and it's actually global research supporting this that shows that you have a certain level of happiness in your twenties. And then you kind of go down this fairly uh, steep uh, negative slope for a while. And then around age 50 or so, I like to think of it as when you have kind of teenagers in the house, you kind of hit this nadir <laughs> and then you go back up again. So in your seventies and eighties and really late sixties, you're happier on average than you were at any other part yeah. of your life. And, and so that yeah. is, that's, that's an important thing to understand is that we actually, not only, not only is old age or is longevity beautiful, but it's particularly beautiful if we embrace the fact that people actually do have higher levels of, of reported well-being on average. And when the research around longevity is more about, it's less about our DNA. Our DNA only accounts for about 20% of our longevity. It's more about lifestyle environment. So these are like foundational uh, things that, that we, we need to know as individuals, but also people in the field, whether, whether you're running an organization as a CEO or executive director, or if you're a sales and marketing team or on the engagement, these are foundational things that we all need to understand and then articulate you know, to, to people we run across. I um, I smiled when I read that part of your book, the the you, because uh, I first encountered it in uh, Ashton Applewhite's book. Yeah. Uh, and I think I mean both of you and Ashton's message is also the fact that you know one of the limiting factors to this happiness is anti-ageism. Like if we don't see ourselves being yeah, see ourselves being in such good conditions and so on, we might unconsciously limit ourselves. And I think that for me, what that was, you know, sorry to do this, but getting back to your book, Ryan, that was one of the key elements that I thought about, you know, you uh, having us as a reader think about place, because place could be this place full of potential, right? Whether it's this to me living industry or not, but why don't we consider that as full of potential? And actually, that was my second piece, because it really speaks about the uniqueness of senior living. And I think this huge advantage that our industry has. That was the second piece that I wanted to get kind of rather granular uh, for activity and life enrichment professionals. You know, I'm not going to ask you which page it is in your book because <laughs> I'm not going to assume you remember by heart. But, you know, like for reference, in, in page 84, um, you know, you, you talk about something really important, which is this idea of uh, developing 
uh, friendship, right? And, and you talk about the fact that it takes time. And I, I think this is essential for activity professionals. I know of organizations where the title of activity director is actually social connection or social connection managers where their role is, yes, to put up an activity calendar and so on and so forth, but also to think about every single day, how can you create friendship between Ryan and Charles and Charles and Megan and so on and so forth. And, you know, I went through MEPAP one, which is the initial part of activity uh, training at the time. And it wasn't so much about that, right? It wasn't so much about, hey, we have this community, this social network that is waiting to be unlocked. So, um, yeah, unpack that a little bit, if you don't mind, because I think that's a crucial element for the audience and for the industry. Yeah, uh, gosh, there's so much here. So I, when I, when I wrote this book, given my background in our field for the last 15 or 20 years, naturally, the lens was people in the second half of life. But what I found is, and I got a lot of feedback from this from readers. I've had readers in their 20s that have picked it up, which I was surprised by. And, and some of the feedback has been the part of the principles in the book and, and societal observations are true across a number, if not all age groups. And so we're at, we're at a point right now where it's frankly, it's harder to make friends than, than it's perhaps ever been paradoxically. We've never been more connected, but people mm -hmm. don't knock on doors. Half of older adults, they don't know any of their neighbors. Uh, we've got, yeah. uh, I, you know, I've seen some data recently that uh, nearly 40% of, of our society now is clinically either anxious or depressed. Like it's, it's there's heavy oh, wow. stuff in our society right now. And, and having relationships, feeling that sense of belonging and connectedness is so foundational for, for finding home. And as you, as you reference, uh, you know, in, in the book on page 84, I happen to have a copy of the book near me. Um, it <laughs> talks about, yeah, there's a lot of hours, you know, that are necessary. I mean, one particular piece, it talks about how you need about, uh, it takes about 50 hours to move from an acquaintance to a casual friendship, about hundred hours to call someone a friend and over 200 hours. Wait, 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 sorry, Ryan, sorry, Ryan, Ryan, if you don't mind, let's just, let's just pause here. Yeah. So if we have people, so what does it mean, right? It means that in a senior living community, if we have neighbors, these individuals need to spend 50 hours to go from neighbor to acquaintance, right? And then a hundred hours to become friends, right? Yes. I, sorry for interrupting, but I, I think this is so important for all of us that work and some of us, like the, a lot of people in the audience work in these locations, in these communities every day. Consider this as, this is where the potential of creating connection happens, right? Sorry for interrupting. Go ahead. Right? I, no, that's I, I would exactly add, no. That, that is, that's that's that exactly important. right. Yeah. And 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 uh, and then two hundred hours to become you know a close friend, and 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 I in fact I had a workshop I mentioned earlier today, and one of the questions was from someone I think probably in her seventies. She's like, "Is it? Is there a time where it's too late to move into senior living?" And and the comment I said was. Um, one of the benefits of, of senior housing that I've seen done well is it has a lot of what I would describe as social capital. So social capital yeah. is a term that, uh, that sociologists use to create, uh, put some value to uh, our relationships. There's, there's bonding social capital where you have similarities and you get close and there's bridging so, social capital where you have relationships with people different than you. And what I said was if, if you, if, there, there, there are there are benefits no matter where where you are in your life journey. However, mm -hmm. however, if if you do move into a community when you're a little bit healthier and more active, where you're likely to have a longer length of stay when you're there, that gives you more possibilities, like you point out, Charles, to have those hours with people to build those relationships, build that social capital. Uh, and, and I, and I think it's, um, you know, so I, so I think there is an element of that where if we, if we have communities where people are only there for three months, let's say, it doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't, 
uh, aspire to create as best a community we can and we can and make those connections. But as a practical reality, we there's there's a bigger benefit if people are there for a longer period of time. Um, and and also last point on this, I. Uh, some of the research is more recent. I wasn't able to include in the book, but there is research around not just purpose, but also if you have a negative view of yourself um, and aging, you're likely to not live as long. So there's that piece too. Like if you're, if you have an optimistic uh, view of, of aging, you're more likely to live longer. So there's something about moving into community, investing in purpose, social connections, so on. It, it seems like probabilistically you'll live a longer, healthier life. When you're there, if those those uh, lifestyles are are uh, are promoted, yeah, we um we had a question in in the Q and A, uh, Ryan, about well, a question and a comment about um, multi age connection, like intergenerational. Do you want to? Get a quick, I know it's a big thing for you, but yeah, that that actually should be the number three, right? Like kind of really in the we type of of common discussion point. Yeah, tell us more about that whole thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'll try to be brief. Um, you know, I think yeah. just go, going back to the retirement word before, we've also, you know, kind of defaulted yeah. as a society to oftentimes have, uh, you know, age segregation that happens. And, and particularly when, you know, we turn, you know, cornfields into senior living communities or they're up on the hill and you, you, know, you maybe see them, but you largely forget about them. Um, I, I use the, the adage, I did a, a TED-like talk for the NIC conference a few years ago, and I, I called it, you know, Shady Acres. Um, and, and, I, and in my book, I'm very careful. Like, I'm not, I lay out the pros and cons of every option. It's really up for people mm -hmm. to choose what's best for them. But the research is pretty overwhelming. Intergenerational relationships are valuable for both the old and the young for a variety of yep. different reasons. Um, uh, uh, but what can happen, or I, I think is emerging, fortunately, is you're seeing some new developments where, where there's more, I, I would call age-friendly design. I helped create an apartment building uh, in the greater DC area in Rockville called The Stories at Congressional Plaza, partnered with a public company, and we created an apartment building that age-friendly design throughout, and we had people move in uh, is as young as old as 90 and, and, and all the way down to, you know, young families and millennials. And we created uh, more of this a bit, uh, opportunity for people to get to know each other, an invitation in certain ways. Another way to do it is to be more mindful of, can we co-locate senior living buildings or, or, or age-restricted apartments or different things in places that are, even if that building is age-restricted, it is, it's adjacent <laughs> to other uses um, and then, of course, uh, you know, are there ways to, to, from a programming perspective, to be more intentional about bringing uh, people of other ages to the senior living community, or uh, just as important, finding opportunities for people to be more engaged in their broader community, and that can especially help with purpose. Yeah, you know, I uh, I know that many of our communities hopefully are, are continuing. Knock on wood here. Um, uh, reopening and um, but I hear that some places we unfortunately have a COVID but obviously one of, one of the devastating impact has been to close and not have help through our volunteers or younger generations and so on so definitely see you know why it's been important but also I mean we've seen the devastating impact of not having it and I think now I want to use this to go back to one of your earlier points which is this idea of secret sauce, right? Like what is this secret sauce? And, you know, obviously, again, in your book, you do a fantastic job at explaining that this industry historically is a healthcare industry, right? I mean, that's initially. But where there is so much potential is in this social model, the social determinants of health. And I think the angle that I sometimes like to say is that people, might spend too much time thinking what's the balance when balance is it's kind of never you never get to balance right it's always a balancing act right because you know what i mean like it changes over time especially as we go through our different life events and so on so i know that it is also something that you and i could speak for some time but in a few minutes like tell us from the vantage of your book 
what is the potential that all of these professionals here in our industry carry as they are the one that enable this human right of purpose, right? Like this potential, the, this social model. Uh, yeah, it's a key question, um, Charles. By the way, when you say when you say balance, uh, unfortunately, I my I don't know how it happened, but I had a a, a uh, ice skating birthday when I was like in third grade, and I spent the entire time on the uh, on the ice. So. Balance is not one of my uh, my strong suits, at least uh, physically. I got to work on that, I guess, as I get older. Um, but but I think, in a way, like we've got this amazing story. We might, we, in a way, we have the magic pill here, and yeah. and sometimes we hide it because, like, to the extent that what we do is seen as a as a as a as a healthcare only thing. You know, when you've got physical needs and we'll serve them. I'm not saying that's unimportant. It is important, but it can be so much more because the, 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 the real uh, uh, value here, the secret sauce, the, the thing that could un unpack more demand is to say that our, our place helps you, increases the odds of living your best version now. And that means that we come alongside people. I know it's it's a little bit countercultural in some respects, but we come alongside people, understand what their story is, like we talked about earlier, help help be an encourager for them to find greater areas of purpose. Uh, you know, we touched yep. on some examples moments ago. Like we can do the subtle curation, like you're talking about in our in the stories in Gresham Plaza. We are we had a lifestyle ambassador, and sometimes we called him like a storyteller. He we had people when yeah. they come in, they fill out their story in some measure, and then we connect people subtly. Hey, you might be interested in getting that, and then you kind of back away in certain ways. So yeah. I think there's this opportunity to like nudge people through place in these very meaningful research-driven attributes. Um, it's yeah. hard, but if we're able to do that, it, it can't be folks in, in, in life enrichment and engagement alone because it might be the best kept secret. And we don't want it to be the best kept secret. We wanna make sure that the, the executive director and the CEOs understand why this is important, understand that it involves investment. We got to make sure that our sales and marketing team and the ambassadors that they understand where this fits in so that when they yeah. allocate time during a tour or when we talk on the phone that we we have as the right set of questions to unpack you know where people I, i'm yeah. not trying to be pollyanna here i mean i recognize sometimes there's urgent things but it's important that we have the opportunity to like slow it down where we can and say you know, here, here's what this is about. Here's why it matters. And to some degree to Martina's other question in the Q&A, like we can be countercultural. Like, yep. you know, hey, in our community, it's not all about productivity, right? It's about, yep. it's about being, it's about belonging. It's about envisioning what you want it to be. So I think there's, you know, there's, 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 there's important stuff that, and it's big, but, but I think it matters. And, and I and I do I think it ties back into some of the messages that that Jill Awesome Vitali you know talked about before and I think I work with several uh, communities right now on the strategy consulting side where they've been wildly successful because they've effectively turned this paradigm of of life yeah. engagement upside down and in fact there's one community I'm working with in Seattle right now where we recently did a focus group um, they had we're going to do a, a, uh, an expansion it, it was crazy they they're a number of communities in that geography are struggling with occupancy. They, it looks like they might have four, maybe be four times oversubscribed for demand. And wow. it's not because the yeah. price point, it's not because the design, it's because people want to be in that culture. Yeah. Uh, we're almost at time here, Ryan, but I, I um, that piece that you write, that last piece was, was really cool. Like, you know, you mentioned the word, the title CEO. You know, I, we like to think of activity professionals as CEOs, right? The chief engagement officer. And it, like Celeste states in the comments, says, love your message about best version of yourself. I mean, I wholeheartedly agree with you that we have this quote unquote pill, which is activity, life enrichment, uh, red engagement professionals, but sometimes we do 
they, we, we just hide it. We don't show it. We don't advertise. We don't empower. And we're not proud of it. Sometimes, unfortunately, I talk to executive directors. Like I ask them, what are you proud of from your uh, activity professional? You know, and it's a, it's, it's a rightful question, right? And I, they watch it. And the person goes in a pauses and doesn't know what to say. When I'm like, this, this should be the one thing you should respond, boom, like that. Um, so anyway. I, I love this. Thank you. Best version of yourself. That's amazing. Um, as we wrap up here, uh, Ryan, I have a, a question for you. Um, wh what excites you? Like in the rest of 2022, like what's, what's the one thing that you're the most excited about when you think about our industry and some of the things that you might be doing? Well, I, I mean, I know all of us are, are um, I'm not sure if we're ever going to be done with COVID, but I, I, I'm excited mm -hmm. to be at a stage where you know people have largely been vaccinated, those who choose to be, and we're in a spot where we're going to hit a bit more of a, a, a new normal. And you're seeing that, I think, with uh, some of the public announcements with occupancy improving and so on. So I, mm -hmm. I'm hopeful that now's the right time for, you know, my world is kind of two different things. One is I'm hopeful that more groups will we'll be thinking hard about these. I would describe them as strategy questions. Who do I yeah. really want to be known as? And how can I yeah. have the biggest impact and how can I align my organization in a way to fulfill yeah. on that vision? And I'm, I, I've seen a lot, a lot of groups, very busy right now. I've seen a lot of groups saying, you know, now's the time to, to, to kind of dig in this in a meaningful way. So that's one thing I'm excited yeah. about. I think there's a timing piece. And I would say on the other side, I'm, I'm excited about, um, the ripples uh, from this book. I I'm excited to, to be uh, seen as um, and helpful as really an objective uh, broker here to say, hey, place matters. And I'm eager to take more of these messages and kind of digitize them and make them more available for, for, for yeah. consumers to process it. And if there's yeah. ways to partner with uh, senior living organizations too, as we mentioned earlier, to like help people advance their knowledge and advance yeah. the sales cycle, you know, eager to help there. But I'm, I'm really encouraged on both sides, both helping organizations improve and kind of what they're all about, but also helping connect more people to a better, you know, housing option. I'm excited too. Thank you so much, Ryan. And, um, you know, I have to say that it's a pleasure to have spent more than a hundred hours with you and call your friend. And um, if anyone in the audience, again, please consider uh, Ryan's work. Again, starts with some of the online tools that he mentioned. I would strongly recommend the book. Uh, Ryan, thank you so much for being with us. My, my pleasure. And it's, uh, it's so fun in so many different ways, Charles. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Um, many of you, thank you again for joining. Many of you, thank you for joining and respecting and valuating and dignifying this profession, which is, Ryan and I and all of us agree is amazing and is the secret pill. If you want to kind of take home some of this uh, finding, uh, Ryan was kind enough to collaborate with us in a tip sheet. And so um, the, share, the link can be shared here in the comments. We'll send you an email afterwards as well. And also, uh, Ryan was kind enough to kind of share his details. So please, you know, take this like Ryan said, as a first step or a second or a third, wherever you are in that process, because the more you do this, obviously the better for you, the industry, and also for the elders you serve today, their family members, and also the ones you'll serve in the future, right? One of the key elements of, of Ryan's ideas today with us and in his book is how can we help people make the right decision with the right education and understanding why place matters. So Ryan, thank you so much for, for all of these uh, amazing uh, insights. All of you in the time that's left, just a couple minutes, I wanted to do a few announcements, which is that uh, we are super excited with Activity Strong. We just released uh, our full schedule for our biggest event of the year. And I'll walk you to the website here. It's our virtual summit on uh, June 21st, which also happens to be the longest day this year on every year, but it's just that we always do Tuesday and this year it's on June 21st. But as an invitation and kind of queuing into some of these ideas that we discussed with Ryan, which is how can we enable this uh, social prescription? 
I can't tell you how excited we are. The day starts with uh, leaders in the activity professionals from NAP, NCAP, and Activity Connection. We then have a, uh, a session with Lynn Katzman and somebody that is about to be announced, which is kind of more our executive panel. The third session is true international experts in the field of resident engagement and dementia care. And these are Dr. Cameron Camp, David Troxell, and Dr. Seltzer. Session four, I'm very excited about this one. It is all about physicians that are actively in their work thinking today, how can we connect with prescribe engagement, right? Very important. What is that connection, that balancing act like we discussed with Ryan, with the medical, but really important, the social connection, the social psychosocial aspect. Session four is all about the leaders in the field of person-centered care, either an attentive greenhouse and the Pioneer Network. And our last session, uh, really cool, all about creative art, creativity in our field. So that is an amazing event. I uh, hope that all of you will be able to join us. Um, we, to have fun towards that particular event, we are having, like we did last year, a senior living got talent competition. And some of you know, because we uh, shared it with our clients first last week, but you can have video submission for a senior living got talent competition from now till June 10th. And then we're gonna have a week of votes. And at the end of our summit, we will have a judging panel that will include residents, include different uh, uh, members of our industry and we'll have a vote on the winning and all of that will be live. Very exciting like we did last year. And uh, the last, I think the last, oh no, sorry, uh, I should not forget about that one. Like we did two last years, we're having fun also with the game of bingo. Like there's a bingo card, you can download it now and we're giving free prizes to anyone that participates and it's all about uh, activity strong and activity profession. And then the last thing I wanted to share is a quick story, super quick. We, um, there's this amazing professional called Edward Kraft that was hosting an event on March 9th in this community. And it was all about old people are cool. And what he did is that he went to the uh, city of Houston and he managed to get the city of Houston to vote March 9th as old people are cool day. And that was an inspiration for us here, uh, and I say here, I'm in Ohio today, but here in DC, where we, with the help of our friend, my friend Tina Sandry from Prairie Sales of DC, we were able to get last week, Washington DC to vote May as Old People Are Cool Month. So I just wanna share with, that with all of you because I love that kind of thing. For me, it's kind of fighting eight angels in one step at a time. And it's again, the idea that we are all cool, including people of all ages. So with that, thank you, everyone. Ryan, thank you so much again for joining us today. A pleasure. Till next time. Pleasure is mine. Thank you.